Welcome to Engineering with Rosie. In today's video, I'm taking a tour of Green Hydrogen Systems. They are a Danish company who make electrolyzers. Their customers then use the electrolyzers to split water into hydrogen and oxygen molecules. If you use green electricity to power the electrolyzer, then we call it green hydrogen, a topic that has generated a lot of excitement, but also a lot of skepticism recently. So I wanted to know what you guys thought. And before this video, I asked you all to tell me what questions you had about electrolyzers. In total, I got about 50 questions. So I was not able to cover them all in this video. I narrowed it down to about 20 questions that I asked Casper Tia Kilsen, Senior Development Manager at Green Hydrogen Systems. And he also showed me one of their electrolyzers so I could get a good look at the equipment and I will show that to you too. What have we got here? We've got a beaker with... We've got some beaker with some water and yeah. two metal plates and then we put some wires on them. Yeah. And then we turn on the electricity and uh, now we see the bubbles forming and, and that's hydrogen. Hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, and oxygen. So hydrogen comes out one side and oxygen out the other. Yes, so hydrogen huh. is formed on the cathode and oxygen on the anode. Okay. So positive and negative. I guess that makes it easy to separate then. Very well. And then typically we, we put in a separator in between here and yeah. then uh, we can you know, direct it in different channels. What kind of metals are, are the anode and cathode metals? So, so this here is just a nickel. Uh, so nickel is, is a very good material for this. And the membrane? Yeah, so it's really uh, a piece of uh, plastic. So it actually, it's not a membrane, it's a diaphragm. So it's, uh, you don't see it uh, on this scale here, but if you look at it uh, in a microscope or electron microscope, you mm. see that there's uh, really tiny pores in there and uh, they're around yeah, one micron or, or smaller. Okay, yeah. so the gas can't fit through them. No, the bubbles can't go through. Yeah. But uh, but the liquid can. We do alkaline water electrolysis. It means the environment here is very alkaline. So yeah. You can actually see if we add more uh, potassium hydroxide. You see the voltage now is around nine volts, and if we add a bit more, the voltage drops because we're making the water a much better conductor, and that's why we add it. The, the downside is, of course, it's very corrosive, so we cannot use any metal we want. And the water? That's just, you know, that water. You just, uh, water the same water that we're drinking? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, basically, you can run the reaction uh, just with water. It was running just with water. Everybody can make hydrogen. It's yeah. easy. You just need two plates of metal and uh, some uh, electricity and some water. That's how simple it is. The conductivity of water is, is bad. Yeah. So that's why we add something that makes the conductivity better. So the okay. ions can move faster from one side to the other. Okay. That's why the voltage goes down and you, it requires less energy. If you look at this, you can also see if you look at the voltage, if you move our electrodes closer, uh, you see the voltage dropping. And that's simply because the resistance gets down because the, the path changes. So when you have bigger distance, the, the resistance goes up. And, yeah, and the voltage goes up. What does the voltage have to do with the amount of hydrogen that's produced? It, it has to. The voltage has nothing to do with the amount of hydrogen. It's the voltage times the current that gives you the power. Yeah. So and you want as little power as possible. Okay. So when the voltage drops, yeah, you use less, less power. power. But the amount of hydrogen stays the same. Yeah, the current the, determines it. So for each electron ah. you put in there, you you form one uh, hydrogen. No, two electrons you form one hydrogen molecule. It's a matter of making bigger and packing these electrodes very closely together in order to you know get as much uh, uh, hydrogen produced in a small a yeah. small footprint as possible. For us, it's really about the, the material abundance uh, somehow. Mm -hmm. If you go to look at PEM electrolysis, mm -hmm. so it's call it polymer electrolyte membrane or pro proton exchange membrane. Uh, mm. It uses a, a membrane and then they have typically iridium and platinum as their catalysts. Mm -hmm. And especially iridium is very scarce and platinum is also quite expensive. So if we're looking into the market sizes projected now, it's just, just not, not enough iridium out there. 
Okay. But but I mean, absolutely certain that in the future you will both have alkaline water electrolysis, you will have PEM electrolysis, and you will have SOEC, so solid oxide uh, yeah. electrolysis. So what does one megawatt of um, electrolyzer cost or um, what, what can you tell me? Sure, I mean, so we're talking very much about levelized cost of hydrogen. So yeah. we are inspired by the wind power industry somehow. Okay, so like for a kilo of hydrogen. Yes, what yes. do you pay? And, okay. and that's of course very dependent on where you get your electricity from yes. and how much you pay for that. Yeah. Uh, but you have a, you know, a capex part, so an investment part uh, of, of, of your electrolyzer, but you also have, of course, your maintenance and uh, uh, expenses in there as well. Yeah. And for us, that's the key number somehow. But you, you, and you can have systems where you have a very low capex, and then of course people say, "Well, we have a very low capex," but the price of hydrogen is not that low mm. because if your efficiency is not high, then it's, it's it, you don't gain anything by having a low capex. Somehow. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's not an easy question to to answer. Mm. So the electrolysis splits the water into hydrogen and oxygen and everyone is mad keen on the hydrogen part of it. Yes. What's happening to the oxygen? In most cases it just goes to the air. Okay. You have a few, very few use cases where people are in need of oxygen and, okay. and where it makes sense to utilize it. Okay. Uh, but but it's, it's very, uh, very rare. Just a lot of electrodes with diaphragms in between, yeah. packed very closely together. Okay. And then the, we call that a stack because they're stacked on top of each other. Yeah. And uh, well, it looks like this somehow. For each two ridges, you have one electrode. Okay. So one electrode, one diaphragm, one electrode, one diaphragm, one electrode, one diaphragm. You can maybe come here. So it, the water basically goes into these tanks we have up here, and these here are separators. So you have the the, the potassium hydroxide pumping around goes up here and then you'd separate the gas from the liquid mm -hmm. and then it uh, goes through a lot of uh, processing afterwards to get the hydrogen clean. Okay. So that's basically it. You have some pumps down here pumping the, the, the lime, uh, the, the water and with the potassium hydroxide around and uh, yeah, a bit of heat exchange because this process heats up so we need to remove the heat. So this is a a small module is put in a container, uh, as you see, so it comes complete. Okay, so you basically see. just need to uh, plug into the power grid. And yeah. We have the power supplies next door here. You have the water cleaning system in here as well, and all the controls. So you can just plug it in and then uh, you produce hydrogen at these 35 miles. Just tap water. Yeah, tap water. Okay. And then we clean it. Uh, we have a reverse, reverse osmosis plant and, uh, and some mixed bed filters to, to clean it up further. But you can this use seawater if you want. Yeah. To desalinate that. Okay. You can actually use the excess heat from the system. Yeah. To to go into desalination. All right. So inland though, in the like in a desert. Well, you need inland, water. You, you couldn't. I mean, you couldn't work there. You, you you need water as you can't produce hydrogen. Yeah. I mean, this is water splitting. So if you don't have any water. <laughs> It's not going to work. <laughs> no. This is around 200 kilowatts. Okay. But uh, if we extend the stack, we can get it up to these 430. And so then that makes, what, like five kilos an hour or something like uh, that? Probably around four. Yeah. Four. Okay. One of the possibilities of hydrogen that seems to have really captured people's imaginations is that we could be using electrolysis to convert surplus renewable electricity into hydrogen. And then some people even think that we'll then convert that back into electricity as a major component of future electricity grids. Do green hydrogen systems see this kind of application as a major opportunity for them? And if not that, then what kinds of applications are they expecting? It's going to be used for transportation and industrial purposes and maybe in some cases also for, for heating, process heating. Yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, only convert it back to electricity uh, if you, <laughs> you absolutely must somehow. Because yeah. you pay a penalty, as you say.
there's a natural hierarchy somehow. I mean, you should use electricity as electricity mm. for all the cases you can. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. That, that's obvious. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but when you cannot use electricity, uh, yeah. you need to convert it to something else. And then hydrogen is a very good candidate. Yeah. And then you can convert it even further if you want. You want to do liquid fuels or ammonia or methanol or okay. things like that. So, so, so it, it, of course, use electricity for what you can use electricity for. Always make the simplest solution. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I mean, it's also worth noting that if you look to the North Sea, for instance, mm. the wind power potential out there is just enormous. Mm. And the electricity grids in the countries around cannot support that amount of electricity. So you can put up maybe 250 gigawatts of wind turbines out there. Yeah. But the electricity grid uh, in Denmark or Germany or Netherlands and and Great Britain yeah. can't support that amount of electricity. Yeah. So in order to utilize that resource, you have to convert it into something else. Yeah. It could be hydrogen, it could be ammonia, or if you have a CO2 source, it could be methanol or, or anything else. It's from thermodynamics, basically, and you yeah. can convert it to a cell voltage. Okay. So you need 1.23 volts yeah. to split water. Okay. But the reaction also requires amount of heat. Mm. So if we convert that to electric uh, voltage too, then we need to be around 1.48 volts. Mm -hmm. That's what we call the thermoneutral mm -hmm. potential. So that means that you have supplied the electrical energy needed and the heat needed in mm. order to drive this process. So, and as you saw uh, earlier that the voltages we had in a in a beaker like that was around five volts or even more. So mm -hmm. there's a quite a big gap, mm. big gap from 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 that. And all that's the the waste, the inefficiency. Yes, and and that just generates excess heat. Okay. So the efficiency that green hydrogen systems state in their brochure for total system load is seventy six point five percent. But how much room is there to improve on this? Could you get like another ten percent? Could we get it above eighty percent efficiency? You can get to quite high, uh, so 85, uh, fairly easy. Okay. Easy, but well, have you done You've been here over a year. I mean, we know where we can improve, yeah. basically, and, and it is okay. uh, very much on the stack level. But of course, right now we have some uh, conversion losses for, for AC-DC conversion as well, which can be improved quite dramatically. Yeah. Um, and that that's just easy okay. to do that. But but over time, of course, we'll, uh, does you can play all these tricks to reduce the resistances and increase the calorie efficiency, and you mm -hmm. can go up in temperature, then everything gets more efficient. And that will bring us uh, very close to these 1.48 uh, volts uh, okay. in a number of years. But like five years, 20 years? No, <clears throat> so five or 10 years. Let's go 10 years back and nobody yeah. believed that the price of electricity would be from where it is now from renewable sources. No. It's... Nobody predicted that. And we'll see the same with hydrogen. Yeah, it's, yeah. You know, once things get rolling, it's going to be tremendous. Well, that was cool. I was really excited to see a real life electrolyzer plus um, the tabletop demonstration of electrolysis. Now that I've seen how easy it is, I feel like I could start my own electrolyzer company. Now, obviously, there's a lot more to electrolysis than the basic principle, um, which Casper showed me on the tabletop, and it's been known and exploited for well over a century already. The main challenges are to do with scaling it all up very fast and bringing the cost down also very fast. Now, cost was the most common viewer question that I had, and I was unfortunately not able to get a really satisfying answer on this basically because there are just so many variables involved beyond the electrolyzer itself. I think I'm going to save that question for another video. So there were also a lot of other questions um, that I couldn't get to today either, um, like transport and storage and e-fuels. Um, I'm going to keep them on my list for future videos, but if there is a topic that you're especially keen to hear about, then please let me know in the comments. I try to prioritize the videos that people are most interested to see. So if you tell me, then um, you're more likely to get the video that you want sooner. Thanks for joining me on this tour today. I hope you learned as much as I did, which was really a lot. 
Don't forget to check out my other videos on hydrogen and other green energy technologies and subscribe and turn on notifications so you'll see when the next one is released. I'll see you in the next video.